evening and a very warm welcome to this, the second edition of the Nurture Channel on Pro Landscaper TV. Hopefully the last with lockdown here, certainly from my perspective anyway. Uh, as always, we're live on Zoom, Instagram and Facebook and will be recorded for Facebook and YouTube on the Pro Landscaper TV channel. My name is Lewis Normand. I'm sales manager at Bernard's Nurseries. We're a family owned UK grower based in Rugby in Warwickshire. And I'm also lucky enough to host this channel. I am delighted today to be able to bring you this topic, celebrating women in horticulture and looking at the female experience in a career in several different disciplines within the industry. I have been lucky enough to assemble for you a stellar panel of top horticultural industry leaders to discuss this today. It's sure to be of great value to everyone from industry entrants to veterans like myself. Unfortunately, Rosie Hardy is unable to join us on today's panel, which is a real shame, but I'll endeavor to get Rosie on another edition of the show later on in the year, as she's incredibly interesting to speak to. Lynn Marcus is also trying to um, log in at the moment and hopefully we'll have her very shortly. To best represent the female perspective, I'm going to hand over duties of question asking to Pro Landscaper magazine editor Nina Mason. Nina will be pulling double duty today. She's going to be both asking questions and contributing as a panellist. This is a huge and important subject, without doubt even more poignantly so at the moment. And I'm sure that myself and everyone watching today will have many valuable takeaways from this discussion. Now you've heard more than enough from me. So without further ado, I'm going to sit back, mute my microphone and listen just like you. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Nina to get things started. Nina, good morning. Panel, good morning. Thank you for joining us today. And Nina, thank you for hosting. Thank you, Lewis. And thank you for organising it. It's such an important uh, topic within the industry. And it's great to, um, to be able to speak on it today. And thank you to all the panellists for joining us at Pro Landscaper, we, um, we have a discussion for every single issue on how we can balance out um, articles, interviews, features, you know, and not just from a gender perspective, but also from every aspect of the industry, you know, landscapers, designers, and try and get as balanced a view as possible. Um, so I suppose we'll, we'll um, just ask the panelists to quickly introduce themselves if possible. Um, just a, a very, very quick brief about who you are and your background. Uh, Susan, can we start with you? Yes, good morning and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm Susan Nicholas. I am president-elect of the Chartered Institute of Horticulture, about to become president in a month's time. Um, I'm a career changer, so mid-30s, I left banking and came into horticulture, which was very, very different. And I've worked in lots of disciplines within that as a consultant and also as a lecturer. Um, at the Welsh College of Horticulture. Thank you, Tamsin. Good morning, everybody. Again, thank you for welcoming me to this panel. Um, I have been in horticulture since I was 16, so it was always my lifelong passion. Um, I started as an interior landscaper, went on to be a parks gardener. I've worked at garden centres um, and then fell into the world of garden media by mistake, really. Um, I've been a greenkeeper and now I'm a garden writer and I'm a gardener, hands on gardener at my family's open garden in Herefordshire. Thank you, Sarah. Hello. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, like Tamsin, I knew I wanted to work in horticulture or some related field at a very young age. Um, so I took up a Saturday job at a local nursery when I was 16, studying horticulture for A-level, went on to do a degree in horticulture, like Tamsin, had a little flurry with um, the Merton Parks Department and um, then set up my own garden design business, garden design and landscaping business for quite some time, in and out of horticulture as well in terms of co um, consultancy work. Um, and then I did a period um, in education where I lectured and I ran a faculty in landscape horticulture and design um, at Hadlow College um, which was a five years very sharp learning curve for me as well as the students I'm sure and the lecturers who've been there a long time um, but learned a lot really about the importance of um, 
good education in, in this subject. And now I'm back full time as a garden designer. Thank you, Sarah. I don't think we've got Lynn on just yet. So um, I think we'll kick off with the first question, if that's all right. Um, so, you know, all from various backgrounds, I mean, do you feel that there is an issue uh, with either deliberate or subconscious bias uh, against women within your port part, sorry, or other parts of the industry? Uh, Susan, can you kick us off? Uh, yes, I can. Um, over, I've been in horticulture for over 30 years, and certainly um, when I came into horticulture, there was very few women in lecturing or in, in any discipline. They just weren't there. It was very, it mirrored the banking I'd left where when I started, there was very few women in banking. Um, so I, I came into horticulture when things started to change. So I think it, the first few years were difficult. I think now... I think the last maybe 10 years, there is more opportunities for women. And I, I, I'm not sure that it's a bias. I, I think it's um, how, how we portray ourselves. And I think it's how we um, focus on the jobs that we get. So it is changing. And whether I, I haven't personally come across any, any negative bias towards myself in the work that I've carried out. That's, no, that's an interesting point. How about you, Tamsin? Um, well, I come from a family of horticulturalists. So when I said I wanted to be a gardener, it wasn't a shock to the system at all. Um, I think where I struggled was at school when I said to the teachers I wanted to be a horticulturalist, they sent me to be a beautician for work experience instead um, or join the army. It just didn't seem an option. Um, but my parents were, were steadfast and really encouraging so you know I just plodded on and ended up being in horticulture um I've never like Susan come across an obstacle um being a woman and I was always very encouraged by my lecturers at college it wasn't um oh gosh you're you're a girl you can't possibly do this I think actually at the time it was late 80s early 90s people were quite excited about the prospect of having women in horticulture from an educational point of view where I hit a boundary was with my peers um, and when I started working in the parks department, I was really shocked at how the public perceived me being a woman pushing a mower. I remember, you know, in my early 20s, people would stop in Bournemouth Parks Department and, and sort of point at me and say that she's a woman. You know, I had long plaits at the time, so I was obviously, you know, and, and they were sort of shocked why was I doing this? And I was asked quite often by people, you know, my age, why are you doing that? Why on earth would you want to do this? Um, so that was my boundary. It wasn't from within the industry. It was a sort of perception that gardening was not a proper job. And obviously you were a bit daft, you know. So that was what I personally struggled with. Um, and every morning at Bournemouth Parks, we started the day with a litter picking round which was no skin off my nose, it was just part of the job. And, you know, you would have people throwing rubbish down in front of you, you know, people my age. And that was where, I don't think that's because I was a woman. I think that's because of just generally the view of, of horticulture at the time. I've no idea if it's like that now, and I hope to goodness it isn't. But I would like people to look at horticulture as a proper job and not something that, oh, you couldn't do anything else. So they've sent you to do this. So that's where I've struggled, I think. Yeah, that's quite an interesting uh, experience, whether that's like you said, whether that's gender related or uh, sector related. I'm not sure. How about you, Sarah? Do you have similar yeah. experiences? Um, yes, I suppose I didn't come from a horticultural family. So when I announced I wanted to be a gardener, um, that my parents were happy to do what um, go with whatever I enjoyed. But I do remember one comment from my father when I was about 10 saying, but you're a girl. <laughs> Not that he was at all, really. I mean, you know, comments back in the 60s, I suppose, um, are very different. To, if that was said now, you'd sort of raise a few eyebrows. But Likewise, he taught me cricket and golf, so he wasn't particularly prejudiced against women doing male activities as perceived at the time. Um, 
when I went to university, I was one female out of 25 on my course doing a degree in horticulture, which was incredibly interesting, particularly when we came to farm mechanics. Um, and um, fortunately, my very encouraging um, teacher at A-level horticulture had let me loose on his car in, in, at lunch times to learn the um, innards of a, an internal combustion engine and let me take out valves and plugs and see how it mistimed and put it back onto full stroke. And, and so actually, um, as soon as my male counterparts recognised that I actually was interested and knew the subject, it all dissipated and we very much just became a cohort of people learning the subject. I think what's so important is that we don't concentrate on whether we're male, female, whatever gender we want to be, but we are interested, as interested in all the parts of the things that we're doing in our subject as anybody else from any other background or culture or whatever. And then I think as soon as you um, ooze interest and knowledge, people start to respect you and they stop seeing um, any barriers that they may perceive. However, I have had some interesting comments um, in the landscaping world. And I think it's important to um, perhaps slightly differentiate between landscaping and commercial horticulture. Um, and, and not uh, forget that in commercial horticulture, historically, women have worked there, um, you know, uh, picking fruit uh, on the food production line um, in, in massive quantities in the past. And certainly my first work experience placement out on a farm um, was with a gang of women. And, um, I, and I have to say that some of the most sexist comments I've ever heard in my life have been from that gang of women. So um, it does work both ways. And this is what I'm saying is we must, we, what we must do is challenge um, any prejudice, whichever way round it is, and, and um, be not party of it. And that can come from both male and female. Then on site, going on, um, on a construction site, you know, as a garden designer, um, initially, yes, did receive comments. Um, I was even told once when I noticed that the setting out wasn't quite right, that um, hasn't she got some ironing to do? Um, which actually just caused me to howl with laughter because I looked at this pathetic comment in the, in the contempt as it, as it was. I said, I don't iron. What a boring occupation and just carried on correcting the measurements. So yes, you come across it, but they are isolated moments. And I would say the majority of people that I work with have been very respectful. There's always been a, you know, sort of a very, um, we're more, con actually, we're more focused on, on the objective we've got to achieve. Um, have, have I missed out on promotion? Have I missed out on making chances? I don't really know, actually, because I only have my own story to tell. All I know is that if you've got um, a self-belief and a passion um, that, that you can make it in this career, and just take, for example, um, a lot of the uh, ladies who were doing a degree in horticulture at Hadlow College, um, I had probably, as head of faculty, three times more inquiries from very top employers requesting graduates when they graduated than I had students. And so every single person who achieved that level of qualification could walk out into a very good job. And I'm just thinking, I live in Kent, just down the road is um, the huge sunnit earth that supplies most of Kent with its um, you know, organic tomatoes as a byproduct of um, energy. Um, with the huge glass houses and one of our female graduates walked straight into a really good managerial job at that huge Dutch owned company. So um, for my own personal experience, I think if you've got drive, if you're prepared to go through all the qualifications, if you're as interested, if I'm going to build, um, draw a wall, I've got to be interested in how it's built, whether I'm male or female, to get respect on site. Does that answer your questions? A bit? <laughs> it's a fantastic point to make, and particularly as well about prejudice, uh, not always being on a, on a male side, but also on female sides as well. There needs to be a, a balance there. Uh, welcome, Lynn. We, we now have Lynn with us. <laughs> Lynn, we were just discussing um, whether there is an issue with bias um, 
in women within the industry? Yeah, as uh, uh, are you asking me if I've experienced any? Yes, please. Sorry, no, <laughs> not at all. No, never, not once. College up through to your role now. Um, I'm a career changer. I was an HR director before, um, and then I became a garden designer. Lots of us are career changers, so lots of us have got a lot of experience in, in other fields of life that we bring to our own businesses when we decide we're going to be garden designers, and that's all to the, to the good. And I mean, it's just, just a rich area of people with sort of multidiscipline. But I said I was an HR director, so um, therefore I don't. I basically ran HR. So if there was any bias, then it would have been my fault. <laughs> but, um, but there wasn't. I mean, I never. I was never brought up to believe in any way that I couldn't do whatever it was that I wanted to do. And if I haven't achieved it, I would always thought it was my fault. I would have occurred to me that it was because I was female. So I think, I don't know whether that's, I, I listened to a lot recently that, I mean, that was very much my cohort of people going through university. That was our attitude towards life. But then we did have an attitude then that everything in the world was moving forward. And I think we probably don't have that feeling anymore. So <laughs> I mean, it was a very optimistic generation. Um, and I, quite frankly, I, I, I don't know the truth of it now. As a much younger woman, you'd have to probably tell me. I mean, it's interesting, um, not too many experiences with bias uh, from very strong women who followed their passions, I think. Um, but do you feel that the contribution of women is now better recognised than it has been in the past? Uh, Susan? Uh, yes, I do. Just just to, to, to make a point on what everyone else has discussed, I think um, bringing professionalism into the industry was the thing that made me successful. So having confidence in yourself and, and that professionalism that I brought from another, you know, when I was in banking, that, that took me forward. Um, but, but very much in the 80s, you were after the 60s and 70s where people did start. It was only then when women really started to, to raise issues about what they could and couldn't do. So I, th I think, um, you know, that, 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 that's, um, you know, that's why maybe some of the people today here on the panel have experienced that at that time. Today, I, I think there's a bet we have the best opportunity today to, um, you know, for women to be recognised in horticulture. I'm I'm not a young person, so I can't say how um, you know how people experience it. But when I I look on social media and, and listen to people, um, you know, I think there's a perception in some areas that that bias is there. I think as an institute, what we do is we offer equal opportunities and it is about equal opportunities. It's not about putting women separately, but it's about giving, giving them the opportunity to develop their careers how, the, how they want and in a fair world. And I think that's, that's my take. But certainly from a young person's perspective, I can't actually say that. <laughs> so maybe uh, Nina, you'd have more, more views on that. I mean, my, my background, I suppose, is a little bit different. Um, probably should have introduced myself properly at the beginning, but obviously I work for Pro Landscaper, so um, mine is more of a journalistic background than a, and a horticulture one. But from coming into the horticulture industry and, and talking to various different people, uh, I, th I felt very nervous as a, as a woman trying to, um, you know, interview various men in the industry, but uh, they've all been very welcoming. I think we're in quite a fortunate industry in that regard. Um, Tamsin, do you feel that the, the contribution of women is better recognised now? Or? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I was at, I trained at Sparshot College and we had the most incredible floristry teacher. She was the best role model ever. She was just absolutely wonderful. Um, and there weren't many female um, lecturers at the time. And but we were encouraged and actually I went on to teach at Kingston Moorwood College um, gosh a few years after that um, and there were a lot more women lecturers within that sort of 15 period 15 year period 
Um, I think talking about journalism and, and media, because obviously that's been a large part of my life, I think the really exciting thing now is I have no journalism qualifications at all. I came into writing as a sort of coffee girl, filing the pictures, doing the practical shoots, and I learned as I went along. And that was really tough, not because I was a woman, just because I just had an incredible amount to learn. But now anybody can get into the world of media if they're passionate about it. And over this lockdown, I mean, I am glued to my phone with Instagram, finding incredible people that are hobby gardeners or enthusiasts or experts. And I do a podcast and I found some people that I've never heard of before that have so much knowledge and they're doing it from their home and they're making money off their Instagram or they're doing YouTube. So our world of journalism has changed tenfold. And although I totally agree, if you want to be a sort of, uh, you know, get it right, college, university is, is absolutely wonderful. But there are so many more ways of entering our world now. And you don't need to go off and dedicate four years of your life to a particular training course. Um, you can just sort of, you know, get go for it and uh, and have a go. And I think that's opened up the world of journalism and horticultural media um, tremendously. And I think we're going to see some new faces. And those women and men, they've put themselves there by being bold and brave and sharing their information through all sorts of different ways. That's quite interesting. I mean, a lot of our contributors are actually industry experts rather than anyone with journalistic backgrounds. So, um, you know, it, it really is open to, to a lot of people. How about you, Sarah? What are your thoughts? Um, well, certainly every year I used to have to look at the um, equality and diversity cut at the university across all the faculties. And uh, Tamsin mentioned a floristry teacher. Obviously, the floristry department was still the majority of students were female. And that you know, perhaps needs to change. Yet, if you look at very famous sort of top florists, they tend to be male. So maybe there's a bias in that industry as, as well, ironically, you know, of, of, of how, if, if you do have a, a very talented male florist, florist, perhaps it's so unusual. I don't know, but <laughs> um, or, or, I don't know, but um, I, just on an objective level, looking at the qualifications and certainly for the degree in garden design, on a full time level, it was about 50-50 split in gender of, of young students coming through. On a part time level, it was more um, females than males. So um, it would imply that a lot of women were not going, uh, you know, who could have perhaps done the full time were restricted in some way, maybe um, by not doing. But but isn't it great that you can now do a part time course and manage, you know, whatever circumstances you 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 need to be in um, equally on our culture, we maybe had a handful of females doing that, whereas one of our best arboriculture lecturers was a female who got um, the, uh, you know, the whole cohort climbing in competitions, gaining their confidence, doing other things other than just chopping trees down, which is, you know, sometimes the perception you have of, um, when, you know, when you're 15 going in with a chainsaw. But um, yeah, so there still is. And But I think um, you, the question you're asking, Nina, um, we, we need to say, is it the industry or is it the careers advisors at schools? It, does it start with the schools where there's, although they have all the training in quality and diversity, they have all the training in not sort of, you know, making assumptions and people making, um, getting the best potential out of students. Maybe there's still a stereotypical view of where people should go because we're not finding the schools send to colleges um, an even balance across the gender to various courses. And for work experience as well, for work experience as well. Mm, so which careers you're kind of led towards? What do you think, Lynn? Oh, sorry, Lynn, I think you're on mute. 
Um, I don't have, my experience is, is pre, as a garden designer has been predominantly on site, so I can't really contribute to uh, the conversation about unequal access from the start or from schools. I mean, it's quite clear that um, school careers advice and also early careers needs a, a massive overhaul in terms of apprenticeships, whether they're male or female. Um, we have a, an appalling um, a skills gap in this country that actually stems from about 1980 when the entire uh, apprenticeship system was scrapped by the then uh, Prime Minister and with it went all the training boards and everything else without which you know we'd be on a par probably with um, with Germany in terms of our young people training so I kind of tend to see it from that perspective in terms of access to um, to careers rather than specifically about uh, men and women because I, I'm afraid I don't I don't have anything I can add to what Sarah's already said on that. Sarah, you mentioned you're one of 25, I think, on a, on a course, and that you kind of, uh, I mean, the impression I got was you had to show your interest. So, I mean, have you had to work harder then to achieve what you have in your profession, starting from that moment where you had to show your interest in that course? Well, I think, I, I, I mean, I went to Y College, which is, is now um, a large, you know, um, uh, university linked to London University that is now shut which used to provide uh, the industry with a lot of um, people trained in environmental studies in agriculture in horticulture etc which is now going to be housing uh, <laughs> um, and I would say that for entry yes I probably did because um, it's, it's hard to say and I don't want to say anything publicly that might be taken up but when I compared what A levels I had to get to get onto that degree course, compared, um, for example, we had to have chemistry then. Um, there was there's a lot of horticultural science involved with the degree. Um, a lot of them hadn't actually got as high grade in chemistry, and I was told I had to get at least a B in chemistry. Whether that's because I was a female, but I think it probably wasn't actually. I think it was because I wasn't from a farming background. And a lot of the land-based colleges back in the sort of 70s, 80s were very much geared towards training people who came from the industry, you know, and so a lot of people I was training with had farms, um, nurseries, pre-existing, um, but certainly on an academic level, I felt, I felt that I had had to prove my worth before getting to the university, but certainly once I was there, no, there was a lot of fantastic supportive lecturers and um and, I, and in fact tom wright who was the lecturer in um ornamental and and amenity horticulture we we wrote for the whole of my career until sadly he passed away three years ago in his 80s so um there was a lot of um one-on-one -on -one support for whether you were male or female um throughout the education and i think what lynn's alluding to is right is that um, a lot of uh, that we do now um, in education is about um, getting people numbers. It's all, you know, financially driven rather than that real um, taking people on board, mentoring them. And in the Society of Garden Designers, we have a mentoring scheme. And I know a lot of other associations do as well. And I think it's that that um, when you're first starting out in any career, whether you're male or female, there's there can be a lack of confidence. And that may be more with some females, particularly if they've had other previous experiences to have somebody who's there for them, a quick call or to say, well, how do you do this? And well, I think I've made a bit of a mistake there. What do I do about that is absolutely invaluable. So, yes, while the apprenticeships are still starting to come slowly creep back into action, I would encourage every professional association and organization to look seriously at um, the one-to-ones and the mentoring scheme so that wherever you you are and wherever you fit wherever your experience is um, and whatever however you feel you might be prejudiced can at least be shared with somebody to get another perspective on it and and um, to boost your confidence to to um, you know really make your career the best it possibly can be absolutely um, Susan have you do you feel like you've had to work harder in your career to get to the point you are now? Um, no, no, I don't. And um, I think, I think for me, I think the perception of what horticulture is is our main problem. So ever since I've been involved in the industry, which was sort of late eighties, 
um, it's it's about what is horticulture. And even today, you know, you try and get some insurance and they don't have horticulture on the drop down menu. So I think it's such a broad church um, industry that it's very difficult to focus on on one aspect of it. I think, uh, you know, Sarah, I take your point that the, the new modern apprenticeships are fantastic. So I, I saw the demise of apprenticeships and then I saw those modern apprentices, you know, they're going up to level seven now and that's absolutely great. So me personally, no, I haven't. But then I, you know, I came in as a mature person, not as a young person. I had the experience of, of, of 15 years in an industry that had a, had a male or female bias, if you like, male bias, but very few females. So I think your personality probably reflects, you know, go like like um, Sarah was saying, going onto site. Uh, you know, I landscaped. I had a landscape business in the early days, and it was very much, uh, you know, people come on and say, "Where do you want this boss?" Talking to my foreman, and, and so there's little bits of that. But generally, in my career, I haven't experienced that bias. And I think, but I think that's down to personality. I think it's down to experience. So. When I went into banking, I was like a, a frightened rabbit with all these men. I'm going to be honest, it was in the sort of late 60s and it was like, oh, I'm in this male world. But I certainly don't have that attitude in horticulture, but I've probably it's out my system as a young person. So I think for young people coming in, it's important that we give them the opportunities, that we mentor them. And, you know, I'm all for mentoring schemes, that we, we make sure that they get the best opportunity they can in developing their career and make sure that they don't have those biases against them. So a lot of it is, like we say, coming down to the, the school aspect. Uh, Tamsin or, or Lynn, do either of you feel like you've had to work hard? There seems to be a bit of a consensus that uh, you don't feel that way um well i think when i worked for the parks department you arrive as sort of an 18 year old girl i think i put myself under pressure nobody told me to work harder than anyone else but you sort of feel gosh i'm the only woman here i don't want to let the side down i've got to finish this on time i've got to start this big diesel machine so i think that was me that wasn't from the men and you know they would happily have helped me but i was quite you know like like Susan was saying and Sarah it, it's it's you've got this level of determination you want to do it yourself so I think that's just a personality thing so I would say I've put myself under a lot of pressure to achieve and also when you're a mother um you know that's a time that I found incredibly hard not anyone's doing other than mine is I was determined to keep my career going I didn't want to have a long maternity leave I thought right I've worked really hard to get where I am I've had so many wonderful opportunities because I didn't have the journalism qualifications I thought I'm not taking a year off I'm taking five six months off because I don't want to let this go and um, my mother always worked and she always said to me you know if you step off the sort of if you step out for too long it's really hard to get back in so that wasn't coming from men that was just really that I think I loved my career so much I didn't want to sort of slow the journey down I wanted to see where it could take me um, so obviously balancing being a mum and full-time work is not easy um, but again I think it's it's possible um, and it just takes a bit of grit and determination. Um, and um, it definitely hasn't hindered my opportunities. Um, so, yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, what what I'm quite saddened about is the number of times I hear women in their 40s and 50s who are now taking up horticulture say to me, oh, I wish I'd have done this sooner. And I think what a shame that they didn't get encouraged early enough. And I hope we don't hear that in 20 years time. I hope we don't hear people say, oh, you know, if only I'd have known you could do this. And I do hear that a lot as well. When we open the garden to the public, you know, people come around and say, gosh, you know, how lucky are you to, to be doing this? So that I think is something I really hope that we don't continue to hear. I think people are very concerned about um, the salaries. 
they're very concerned about working in the cold, strangely, which actually I can promise you, you get used to. Um, but yeah, I just think that saddens me that people haven't gone for it for some reason. And I really don't want to continue to hear that. I mean, as Lynn said earlier, that I mean, design particularly is um, it's quite a few career changes um, coming into the industry. It makes you wonder what prevents them from going into it a little earlier. Um, well, I, lots of things. Money, for a start, I should think, is one big part of it. <laughs> I became a garden designer when I became a mother. Um, so that was because I decided that I didn't want to work in the city and not see my kids and leave the house at seven in the morning. I wanted to have direction over my own life and my own, um, my own day. And I much, much prefer that way and not be beholden to anyone, not be beholden to partners, directors or anyone else. And I actually prefer working like that. Lots of people don't. Um, I think in terms of um, my experience subsequently, I think you have to remind yourself that if you're a garden designer and you're on site, you're pre predominantly with men until the planting team arrives. And with the planting team comes often the manager who might be female and lots of women in planting, but you don't see that many women on the JCB, unfortunately. <laughs> so, um, so you are on site most of the time with men, but there's never any difficulty with that because after all you brought the project in and they wouldn't be working there if it wasn't for the fact that you've actually brought that job in. So you've created an awful lot of, um, you've created that pro project, you've created the money from that project. So, and that's something to feel really, really chuffed about. It's one of the most wonderful things going on site, seeing so many people working on a site, knowing actually that's because of you, because you brought that job in and there are lots of people working. So you do, I, I promise you, if you, if, Everyone on site knows that too, so they wouldn't be very sensible of them to start sort of uh, giving me a hard time just because because I, I had to be female. And of course, they don't. They're all really, really lovely. So um, I don't. I haven't had the experience on site with men before. Um, I have had other had other things on site which I haven't particularly liked, which are about diversity, which aren't about being female or not. Um, which is, uh, I won't go down that road right now, but actually, you know, I haven't experienced it at all. I would say, which is, I think, quite important, is it's very difficult for the individual associations and professional bodies to go and make the same noise. We're talking about such a range of careers here. We're talking about everything from being tree surgeons to being um, a garden designer or, you know, all sorts of careers. And it would be more sensible if we all joined up with a common message on land-based careers and actually tackled the schools and I won't say the ignorance, we say the lack of knowledge in schools and, uh, about this, this career that's open to everyone and encourage more people into the industry. It's interesting because there are certain parts of the industry which are um, more of a 50-50 split and others which are more male dominated. Uh, I mean why do we think that for landscaping for instance struggles to recruit women and what can we do to encourage women to pursue that type of career? Lynn, did you want to start us off? What do you mean by landscaping? Do you mean, what, are you talking about working in landscape contracting companies? Yes, as a contractor installing. Landscape. Installing. Because you would, that's the same reason you don't see many women on a construction site. You don't see that many women bricklaying, do you? So you don't see that many women um, digging trenches and putting in foundations. Um, I don't know whether or not other people, Sarah might have had other experience on site with seeing more female landscapers, but as I said, I don't tend to see the women until um, they're a very welcome site when the plants arrive and the trucks are being unloaded and all that lovely green stuff is coming off. Um, so up until that point, it's predominantly all male, and I presume they're simply not attracted um, to, to sort of digging, building walls. I don't, I don't know why that is. I find that interesting. I'm not sure it's just a matter of strength or sort of physique. I don't know. Maybe someone else can, can offer some explanation. But, um, but actually, more also interestingly, and others, most of the partners and directors in landscape contractors are also men. Uh, so I, there must be some women. I'm sure there are. If I think about it hard enough, Sarah will probably add to that. She's got more diverse experience than me. But um, in women of seniority in landscape contractors, I'm not sure that there are that many. And for obviously, far more women in nurseries. So um, I don't I, know. I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Maybe Sarah has some better words of wisdom to offer. <laughs> well, I, and I think I think it's about work experience as well. Um, 
so it's you know as as Tamsin said she was sent off work experience to a, a beautician <laughs> or, or a beauty course or whatever you you did and I, and I think this is where the value of the land-based colleges is is that they give on any diploma um, and, and you know yes yes you, you can bypass that and yes you can enter it but when it comes to a discipline like landscaping where there are so many facets to it even if you don't end up you know um being a brick worker for the rest of your career and you actually you know, to actually have a practical in it and understand it and know how it works etc is going to give you more confidence to if you want to enter into that field more and and so what we're what we're finding is that those sort of very practical levels level two and level three in colleges where a lot of schools are sending children rather than do a levels they'll come and do um, a, a diploma um, the schools are sending more males than females um, so it's sort of it's, it's you know I always treat horticulture education as a bit like a sausage if you don't feed it at the beginning it doesn't come out at the end and you know or, or not in quantity anyway and and so we, we've got to see I think um, a diverse when we're training and training at colleges as well it's much easier to train people on the plant side you you need less resources to actually show them good quality construction how exciting it is to to know how to piece something together is it's often lacking because it demands more resources so I think we it's there's no quick fix to this there's absolutely no quick fix but I think attitudes are changing perceptions are changing but still in our shops you've got toys that you give girls and toys that you give boys you know if, you, if you're going to buy an, it, happy birthday nephew and there's a picture of a digger happy birthday niece there's a picture of I don't know um uh, the Little Mermaid or something so we are still I mean it's whether it's you know horticulture actually um, is one of those few professions where there is opportunity for male and female right across the brush without you know happy birthday Sarah and I get a picture of a flower well that could go to a male or a female or a landscape but what I'm saying is that in our society there is still such an entrenchment well right from when children are very little as to the expectation of what they will enjoy doing when they grow up. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely say we've all experienced that, I'm sure. Um, one thing that I've noticed from talking to people for Pro Landscaper is um, from designers, uh, they would like to understand the installation more and a lot actually go out and, and learn about the installation side to improve their design. Uh, I mean, has anyone else experienced that or, or I, I suppose, um, encourage that. All, all I can say, um, Nina, uh, Nina, is where, where people, because there's sometimes a health and safety issue about taking somebody on sort of, you know, just temporarily to come and join in the construction team. Um, formally, it can happen through work experience. Um, but I would say that as a designer, make yourself interested so I say, oh, when you've dug the hole, send me a picture and I'll come on site and I want to see what you're doing. I want to see what you're doing. I want to learn from this. You know, don't just do it. Don't just put the, the bars in and you know, even if it's just a picture, let me see it because I want to know about it. And I think I think that is a, just a small start for designers to make sure that um, they're not frightened of putting their hands up and saying, I don't know about this. Tell me, tell me, how do we do this? Let's work as a partnership on this. How do we collaborate? How, you know, don't be frightened of saying, I don't know about this. I want to know. So that for your next project, you have got a little bit more knowledge on that level. Can I just make a point? Um, interesting enough, when, when sort of, if we go back sort of to the 2000s, 10th century, there was a lot of career changes came into the college that I worked in. And, um, they were a mix of male and female. What we've seen over the last number of years is a reduction in the provision of, of, of the more practical courses. Well, also in HG as well. So um, whereas maybe when I started, you got a broad aspect. You did hard landscaping. You did, you know, the nursery production. You, you did everything. Now it's very narrow. So doing a, a national diploma in horticulture for instance uh, the number of units you take is very narrow so 
people aren't getting that opportunity. But I think for me, the return of the apprenticeships will give people both the practical experience and also the academic work to back it up. And I think that's the thing that excites me for the future. I deal with a lot of career changers who come to the Institute and they're, it's very, you know, 50-50 of both male and female. So I haven't experienced a lot of female ch career changes. It's, 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 it's literally equal uh, of each, which is quite encouraging. Um, but I think, I think the education, the, 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 the reduction in, in delivery of courses, you know, we've got colleges merging, colleges disappearing, uh, for, and all it's all backed by lack of funding, uh, where the funding pots go. But I think we're seeing a change in that now. So I think that's encouraging. And a lot of it seems to come back to education, the colleges and, and uh, before college as well. Tamsin, did you want to add to this? Yeah, I mean, running the gardens, um, we've got four acres and it's very much looked after myself and by myself and my uncles. But we do have and we have had in the past... Um, people on the women return to farm and gardening. I think they've changed their name now, so I've probably got that wrong. Um, but it's for men as well. And that's a brilliant scheme because you actually pay the person to come and work with you. Not as much, but I like that. I'm not so keen on people just volunteering. I think if we're gonna make horticulture a possibility for people from all financial backgrounds then we need to pay them so we would have someone for a year we pay them to come in they have to cover or I have to cover with them all the things on the checklist so pruning propagation lawn care and we work through it together so I think it's a day or two days a week um and we actually haven't done it for, for a year because we kept the lady that was working for us. It was so successful. Um, so I think this is the way forward, is that you have one or two people that you really nurture. They get some financial support out of it. They get your time. They get an experience of a full year's cycle in the garden. You see, that's the other thing with horticulture. It's not something you can just learn at your desk because you need to see it with your own eyes. And, you know, seeing a garden through a full year, there's, that is just absolutely golden and so valuable. Um, so I think schemes like that are brilliant, where it's hands-on, you've got a mentor, you can ask whatever you like, you're in a safe environment as well. You haven't got lots of other people saying, well, why did they ask you that silly question? You know, you're, you're just chatting as you're weeding and it's 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 absolutely brilliant so I'd love to see more of that going on definitely. I mean certainly the RHS are doing um, quite a lot of going into schools and um, you know they've got this sort of they've got a scheme where um, a profession is going in and and taking a group of, of children to design a garden or this that and the other so the, the RHS work in schools and certainly um, the Chartered Institute of Horticulture and Bali, they've, they've all got initiatives and I'll probably miss people out. So apologies if I have, have got initiatives where they've, they've you know, really gone in as, a, as an organization to try and gain the interest. But, um, you know, as Susan says, it's about also feed it, being able to then feed them into, and, and parents, don't forget the parents are huge influencers in all this. The parents need to be secure that they're you know, when they've got a 14, 15 year old are going into a mainstream education where perhaps they can get a grant if they want to do higher education so that they're going into the normal system of education if we want the sort of numbers to match the um, demand at the moment. I think this, the scheme that uh, Tamsin's talking about is an excellent scheme. And I know that if for a fact there's a waiting list for people to join that scheme. But there is a cost to the person who wants to do that. So the, the, the people that are going to work for, for that scheme, they actually pay um, an amount of money. So if you have to, you know, fork out your own money for something, then you really do want to do it. But I think those opportunities... Um, uh, are amazing and I think sadly with COVID um, what's happened is there's been a reduction um, in that scheme but absolutely fantastic all the um, and I think is, 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 
Oh, sorry, Susan, I think we've lost you a bit there. Is there Jamie? It might, it might be just, uh, it might be just my internet. <laughs> Maybe that's lost it. I mean, has anyone experienced any recruitment drives directed at women in horticulture? Yes. Yeah, I, oh, sorry. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> Yeah, I, I did, it, it, when I worked for the Welsh College, we did um, women in garden design. So it was it was piloted for women to return to college. So those that basically, um, you know, had a career break because of children. It was actually European funded at the time, but it was very successful. So it was about, and it was, it was labelled women, women returning women into garden design. And I think you couldn't even write that now, could you? <laughs> but uh, it was successful. I think also parents, um, because they're often are, uh, you know, sort of working behind the scenes to sort of <laughs> uh, advise their their um, children. I think parents also need to recognise that you can you can go right the way to level seven, eight with horticulture. It's you know it. it it doesn't matter where you get off the train in education, you can go do a practical course, you can do this, but you can be um, a chartered member of the um, Chartered Institute of Horticulture, you can be an accredited registered member of the Society of Garden Designers, you can be um, a chartered landscape architect, you know, it, it, in a sense, those, those sort of, the, the, the schools need to see that this is a career that has facets for every type of student, whatever their whatever their um, uh, particular motivational drives are, whether it be academic or more practical or whether it's plants or construction or sales, horticulture embraces all, all the sort of parts of this and research and science. And I think um, in schools particularly, that they need to understand that full portfolio. And this is where Pro Landscaper, um, everybody can help to promote that. It's not just one of us sitting in a little silo doing our thing and like attracts like then. It's about seeing how you can merge and move. Certainly, I mean, just from the um, stories of everybody here, we've all shifted around in our careers. I never thought I'd become a teacher. <laughs> so, that's why I went into horticulture to stay out of the classroom, you know, but uh, it's, uh, it's a strange way how life develops, isn't it? And But horticulture has so many opportunities for male and female. Can I just add that I think, um, although I'm all, all for people coming at horticulture at a really young age, that I have learned a tremendous amount from people that have joined the industry industry later and like Suzanne and you know people like Lynn who have brought those skills forward you know I don't have experience in financing or HR or so I think those people are just as valuable so I just wanted to say that you know coming in at any age is brilliant and all these other skills even if you know you were in the NHS I mean it's so useful to have someone with first aid <laughs> so I just think it's great whenever you join, whatever you've done before, there's always some way of connecting a previous career with a horticultural career. Because as Sarah said, it's just so wonderfully varied. I think yeah. the important, sorry, I was gonna say, I think the important thing is that people, you know, who are dealing with career changes, identify those transferable skills. So when someone comes and says, I want to go into horticulture, you know, I've got a degree in biology or I've got a degree in marketing, then you can direct them to the opportunities that are open. So I think I think more and more, I think, you know, well, certainly when I left school, it was what you want to do and that was your career for life. Whereas now people have multiple careers. I changed mine when I had my children. So I took that opportunity because I couldn't do my, my old job to, to do a new one. But I think, I think, I don't, I think more careers knowledge of identifying those skills and how you know how, how to to change career and um, you know we're the institute are doing uh, our own qualifications now and one of them is an introduction to horticulture just to, to to allow those people an insight into our industry so they look at all different aspects so that they can see the opportunities because when people come and ask for careers change and as i say it does end up on my desk 
they don't know all of the opportunities, so they might come with a perception, but then when you introduce them to every discipline within our industry, it's like, whoa, there's this and this and this. So I think as you know, people involved in careers, it's, it's our duty to make sure that we promote the whole of our industry. I completely agree. Um, we're running out of time, um, so I'm just going to move on to the next question. Um, so what would you like to see change in industry in general um, that would make it a, uh, a more even playing field for women in middle senior management roles? Susan? Um, I, th I think um, mediums like this where we're actually showing what people can do, I, th I think more promotion but in a in a managed way so um you know it's very with social media it's very difficult to for us to run away with ideas but i think you know you need to keep your firm, feet firmly on the ground and and look at you know our core message and, and stick to that thank you tamsin yeah i mean i think it would be really sensible as we've sort of suggested that lots of different associations and charities join together to, to work this through. Um, you know, we can all go into schools, which is brilliant if you can actually get access to those children with their hectic timetables. And I've done that in the past, gone in to talk to children about becoming a garden writer or, or journalist in general. But I think, like you say, we need to show them the whole portfolio um, of what's available and as, as early as we can. So I think, you know, more discussion between groups to come up with something would, would be amazing. Um, and I think the more role models we have that are women and uh, well, the better. And we're very lucky that, that there are now. There really are some incredible um, people out there and I think people having um, you know the RHS president Elizabeth Banks I think it was 2010 she made some incredible changes in the RHS we you know I suddenly became an RHS judge there's a lot more women on panels so you know I think as individuals we can all do our bit but together we could make a much bigger difference. Absolutely Lynn you were saying a similar thing earlier. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think, I mean, we we're finding, we found that lots of, uh, there are colleges that don't even know that you can be a garden designer, I certainly don't know about the SGD. Um, the ones that we have relationships with tend to be the educated colleges. Um, but then uh, we can't do all of this on our own. We're just one organisation. And I definitely think a pooling of resources for land-based careers between us all is probably the most effective way to tackle uh, colleges and schools around the country because then we've got shared resources. Um, and then women, women, you know, like any other industry in terms of actually be coming into senior roles in whether or not it's board of directors, wherever they are, um, it, it's down to organisations to proactively make sure that their uh, senior management is representative of society in general, not just with women, but just representative of society so that they're contributing to the decision making at that level, which is critical. But actually, what the other interesting point we haven't touched on, which is not specifically women based, is of course we've got a million young people who have just left our country and gone home. Now, OK, they didn't all work in bars. <laughs> a lot of them worked on construction sites, and I don't know how many work for landscape contractors, but there is a huge, uh, going to be a huge skills gap. We can't hang around on this. We have to actually get young people training. Otherwise, these things aren't going to happen already. Construction has come slow down for, 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 for homes because there aren't enough people here because they've gone home to uh, because because of uh, Brexit. So we have to, we really do have to, to work on this if we're to actually uh, develop careers and actually see that they're careers rather than just chucking people into jobs to lift a spade um, and actually work together to achieve that. I think that would be my idea of the right way forward, but yeah. Sarah, did you want to have the final remark? Um, well, I think everybody's touched on what I, what I could say and add to, but I think also um, a separate issue is I think as an industry, we need to stop considering the various parts of our industry in a, in a hierarchical way. So, you know, is it, you know, quick fame and fortune and Chelsea Gold Garden as a garden, you know, who gets the accolade, the garden designer? Um, very rarely does the um, 
the media concentrate on the contractor, for example, or the person who laid the exquisite design on, on you know, and I think there is a tendency um, in modern you know Instagram and media to concentrate on the quick click the quick things that are going to interest a lot of people um, now if you're a young person just like you aspire to be the best footballer you know sometimes or the best um, you know javelin thrower or this that and the other you are looking at these role models and I think it's important that and this is where media can help is that we really value whether you're you know um, a garden designer a female garden designer um, a, a gardener, male or female, um, somebody who lays bricks, somebody who's a ground operator, an electrician, all these sorts of aspects and skills that have come into gardens that we actually celebrate them equally and that we see those roles. Otherwise, we, we are going to see um, people not, you know, not, not a, um, a widespread of people going into all the various aspects that make up our profession. agree and I'm so sorry that we, we've run out of time to discuss everything further it's such a wide topic and a huge huge thank you to Lewis for organizing this it's fantastic to have a really strong female panel but we don't want to deter men from being part of the debate either and I really appreciate you uh, being brave enough to take us on <laughs> did you want to um did you want to close us off I'd just like to say thanks very much Nina for hosting and thanks um for the panel because uh, it has been fascinating and um, in an hour there's never enough to say uh, what you want but um, it, it's been really interesting and I think the beginning of much much more uh, one of the most important takeaways uh, I've had taken there from is mentoring the value of mentoring and um, also we've long talked about <clears throat> the problems lying at schools with uh, bringing people into the industry and I think that a huge part of um, what it is that isn't bringing uh, women into the industry when they're younger um, lies at the lack of clarity on what they can, what the whole industry can offer to women. Um, so fingers crossed we can improve upon all these things and that we can have these discussions in the future. But thanks so much to um, Nina for hosting and to Sue, Tamsin, Sarah and Lynn and Nina of course for answering as well. Um, thank you very much and I look forward to having uh, another discussion in the future. Can I just um, add, there's a quite a few questions we didn't get around to and a few comments as well. So please do add these to our Facebook um, where some of our panelists perhaps may get around to answering them on there um, in a comment. So please do uh, have a look at that. And uh, we also, if you can join us for next Tuesday at 10 a.m. for an interview with Ken White from Frost. Brilliant, thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.